episode 45. Here we are. Karen Tietze Cox, speech pathologist and all round vocal guru. And Druvy the cat. <laughs> Here we are then, joined Weird. by, this is Drew. Weird. Lovely little strange fluff man. creature. Yeah. He is strange though, isn't he? He is, well, he is a, he's a little bit stupid. That's the thing, he's not, so, he's not that bright. I think that's the thing about him. Um, but he makes it, I feel like, a, like an evil villain or something. Yeah, You know, Pink Panther. I'm plotting, plotting for something. Cyril Sneer. <laughs> Tap note. Did you have a tap note? Yeah, tap note. That's yeah. right. Anyway, we are filming. Karen Tietze. We are live, I think. Um, we're here We're here for an episode with Karen Tietze Cox, a wonderful speech pathologist. Um, met her many times at events, uh, usually in the US, but hopefully one time she'll hopefully, uh, come yeah. over here. I'm sure it's going to happen. One um, we, this was an, uh, an opportunity to oh. ask the expert. All right, see you later. All right, see you in a bit. Uh, it was an opportunity Bored. to ask the expert, uh, expert being Karen. Um, we've got questions about, is whispering actually bad for you? Uh, what's, the, what's the problem with external muscle tension in singing? Um, and also, Karen reviews a listener's vocal problems live. But do you know what else we've got? Go on. We have the premiere of Dr. Ingo Tietze's, her father, his revised, renewed, incredible straw video. No you, lies. You may have seen the, the ridge that was recorded in his, well, outside of his office, in the hallway by a secretary, and it went viral in the singing world. Well, it's been remade, and we have the premiere, only to be seen here first, I think. That's right, like and that. we'll, we'll cut that in at the end of the episode. So once the episode finishes, there'll be 12 minutes of um, the three-part series back to back. Get your popcorn ready. So stick around if you are a genuine nerd. But, but, but what's the one thing we'd like people to do? Go to the Facebook page, please. Our Facebook page, The Naked Vocalist. Facebook.com forward slash The Naked Vocalist. It's, uh, there's a lot of activity going on over there at the moment. It's you exciting. Are you sure about that? Sure about that? The oh, it's not, is it? No, it's not. I'm so sorry, I'm the TNV worst. TNV questions. Who named it that? We did. Why? Any, I don't know. I don't think the naked vocalist was available. Search the naked vocalist. To be honest, then. you could search the naked vocalist. Angry now because yes. I'm, one, I'm being defensive. Uh, yes. But join us on there. There's loads of stuff going on, loads of thoughts. A little bit of slagging off, I guess, but you know, you've got to take it all, haven't you? Take it all with you the know. roller coaster. Hate is going to hate. Anyway, this is incredible. She's incredible. Take it away. OK, today we are super duper lucky um, to have Karen on the show as a Ask the Expert oh, yeah. sort of section. Um, Karen Tietze Cox, speech pathologist um, based out of Salt Lake City. Daughter of, of previous guest, Dr Ingo Tietze. Yeah, um, so we're, get, we're what... getting the whole family in. And I'd say, Karen, as well, one of the highest viewed if not the highest viewed episode, so you've got a lot to live up to here. <laughs> he did well there, but it just goes to show everyone's... Ruined my life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> everyone's a geek. Um, but, uh, yeah, so currently speech pathologist, um, uh, board member of uh, Pan American Vocology Association, um, also loves speaking and educating the public with her father, the father of vocology. We've met Karen many times um, at uh, events uh, across America, um, and been really lucky, actually. Feel very lucky to have been a party to your talks and your uh, seminars on everything from voice science, formants and harmonics, vibrato. You even put a, uh, a scope in my mouth uh, at one point. I think she did the same to you, didn't she, Steve? Mm. Uh, not painful. It was very good. I enjoyed it, Karen. Thank you. Um, so, yes, uh, tell us a bit more about what, what you're up to at the moment. What, what's uh, Karen's diary looking like right now? 
Well, we just finished a conference in Scottsdale, Arizona, the Pan American Symposium. Um, and we did that in conjunction with the Fall Voice uh, Conference. So we had uh, several otolaryngologists, speech pathologists, um, or laryngologists. Uh, we were excited about our turnout um, there. It was an exciting and, and thrilling conference. So we're just at the tail end of that, assembling all the comments and um, and feedback. And we are excited about the new initiatives for outreach. We um, that's where we launched the the simulator, and are excited about getting feedback about that too as we learn more about voice science and um, how it applies to exceptional voice use. Uh, that's that's really the goal of PAVA is to talk about um, not not just singers, but anyone that uses their voice in an exceptional way and bringing many different disciplines into that that group. So. It's really, and, and so, so do you have next year's conference already planned? Yes, it's in Toronto, Canada. So we are Pan American. We are planning on going up north to um, Toronto and eventually in a few years going to South America also. Woohoo! So. <laughs> that sounds great. I think I'll be at the Toronto one. I'm going there in a couple of weeks to see uh, um, your father present um, and uh, see Ryan Luchuk um, yeah, as well. Yeah. So, but we'll talk. We'll actually uh, we'll let everyone know what that simulator is later on in the episode because I'm sure a lot of people will be thinking that sounds exciting, but I have no idea what it is, and uh, I can't. We can't wait to tell them about it. But um, on to the subject today, then. So we have you on, luckily, because we get. Uh, a lot of questions through uh, through the podcast, lots of people who want help or guidance in a certain area. Um, and when it comes to uh, your particular, let's say, specialities and background, then it's really great that you can come on the show and talk to us uh, a little more about these particular subjects. So uh, we're, we're talking quick fire questions for you, Karen. Actually, and I pre pre presume actually they're not going to be very quick, so let's, say. let's not say that. <laughs> but um, let's get in there. So the first question we have is from Matt, and he, he's in the UK. The question is, what's your opinion on extrinsic muscles, um, brackets, any other that aren't the TA or CT, which are the, the vocal fold muscles or intrinsic muscles, um, what's your opinion on the extrinsic muscles and their use in singing? How can you tell if they're being activated and is it okay to rely on them at all? Or should we be trying to disengage them as much as possible? If so, is this the idea of where support comes in? That's a very good question. I, I am, um, and I, and I hope that the field starts going um, in this direction when we really start thinking about the larynx and how it interacts with the vocal tract, we really need to address those extrinsic muscles. And in the past, the, the use of the extrinsic muscles was kind of what he was alluding to. Do we want to disengage them altogether? Um, never, never use them. Uh, and that I think is changing because we have learned that there is an interaction between the vocal folds and the vocal tract. It isn't just about breathing. Um, so the, the old train of thought is it's about respiration, phonation, um, resonation and articulation. It goes in that order. But we are starting to realize that really the, the sustainability of the vocal folds has a lot to do not only with, um, you know, providing air pressure and flow, but also this interaction with the vocal tract, and that's the tube. Now, that, that vocal tract can be altered um, by these extrinsic muscles, and that's a lot of what we do when we tune. We change the shape of the vocal tract, and the extrinsic muscles of the larynx can help in doing that by either relaxing them and lengthening the epilaryngeal tube or the tube right above the vocal uh, folds, 
or by shortening them and narrowing them. And when you shorten and narrow them, that can produce another strategy for tuning, formant tuning. So um, the thought was, well, we don't want any extra muscles working but the vocal fold muscles and those inside the larynx. But that's that really isn't the case. I think our, our philosophy is that we want those muscles to be very flexible so that you can alter the vocal tract, but we don't want to disengage them altogether. We don't want them to go flaccid because that would be a very boring sound. <laughs> it would be the same all the time. And you want to be able to adjust those for different qualities of the sound that's produced um, when you tune. So if, if we never had that bright quality, you know, sometimes we want that in the sound and we can adjust that by changing those extrinsic muscles by shortening the vocal tract or narrowing it or lengthening it and producing more of a, a, a covered open sound. But all of those strategies help in um, creating more energy and help in uh, uh, the efficiency of the vocal folds in their, their vibration. Right, and would that's you, that's the big word, isn't it? Yeah. Would you would you say that, the Karen? Uh, probably what Matt is alluding to is, in the, especially in the, in the contemporary world, um, is there a, is there a case of of excessive tension? Oh yes. You know, I mean, and... sure. If there is excessive tension outside of of the vocal folds, um, intrinsic muscles of opening and closing and and also the CT muscle that helps with with the, um, the pitch. If, if there are other muscles getting in the way of producing good sustainable sound, yeah, you wouldn't want that, of course. Um, but sometimes we we want muscles to tighten and, and change the vocal tract. Um, but we just want them to go back to normal again. It's like a pendulum shift. You, um, everything in the body is, is kind of like a, an oscillation. And yes, we go to extremes in our voices, but we wanna be able to come back to normal again. And we wanna have the flexibility to go to extremes, but then come back. Um, for, for example, a scream, um, it, it would be very effective for someone who is doing in, um, if, if they want to do a scream-like behavior uh, to vibrate and tighten extrinsic muscles to create the chaos in the, in the scream, but not to produce extra tension of the vocal folds. So getting those extrinsic muscles to do what they we want them to do without getting in the way. Right on. And, and would you have a strategy um, or your favorite strategy as a therapist um, to... Um help someone to kind of reset those extrinsic muscles so that they do return back to normal. Absolutely. So it's, I, I always tell um, my patients not to be afraid of, of touching their neck, <laughs> to feel these muscles as they're activating, to get to know their larynx um, and know what muscles are, are tight and what needs to be relaxed and so we do a lot of stretching under the tongue act, getting those muscles to release because sometimes when we go into a kind of a protective state if we've been coughing or if we have a cold or something's not working right we want to tighten up and protect and instead I, I suggest well let's loosen these muscles up under the tongue or um, on the side of the larynx those extrinsic muscles if you can yawn that's going to stretch those muscles so they can go. I mean, we, we know in muscle physiology that if you stretch to the extremes, then you can find your middle, and that's where you're the strongest. And so you want to be able to have that flexibility and stretch those muscles um, and so that you have more mobility. Right on. Great answer. Okay. I'm sure Matt can extrapolate what he needs from all of that wonderful information. Mm. Okay, moving on. Question two. Um, Steve, do you want to read it out in your I wonderful mean, tones? <clears throat> I'll do my best. <laughs> Is it true or just a common myth that a whisper makes you more hoarse? And if so, does a scientific explanation exist? And that's from 
Sigrid. Sigrid. In Norway. Thank you. Great. You know, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know any evidence that a whisper would make you more hoarse. Um, what the whisper does, however, is it puts the vocal folds in, a, in an artificial configuration. In other words, it, I don't know if you can see this, but, but if, with a whisper, it, uh, um, usually when I look at that, the laryngeal findings show that the front part of the vocal fold is quite squeezed and the back part is, is more open, creating that, that turbulent sound. Now, the reason that I'm, I'm not a fan of the whisper is not because I think that the whisper is going to cause trauma to the vocal folds. Maybe it will squeeze in some areas that we don't want, but they're not vibrating. So it's not going to cause, you know, a, a nodule or something like that, but it is artificial. We don't typically talk in a whisper. And if we want the vocal folds to come together and we want the muscles to remember how they should come together, we should be practicing the the right way to do it instead of whispering which is an artificial configuration it's not it's not a um something that we would want long term we wouldn't want the vocal folds always to be in that position so what i tend what tends to happen in in um the clinic is that those people that are chronically whispering like this they don't know how to change the vocal fold configuration to voicing again because they've practiced the whisper for so long and that's what we want to undo we want to undo that that muscle memory of the whisper i'm very interested karen actually to hear um uh, is there an average amount of time in which people spend in that whisper where it then becomes accidentally a permanent fixture? Well, yeah, it's, it's like anything else. The more you practice it, the more permanent is it, it is. It's the same with coughing, throat clearing, whispering. I mean, we practice that long enough. <laughs> we don't need to practice that anymore. Um, that's an easy thing to do, right? So what we want to practice is getting the vocal folds and the intricate muscles of those those um, intrinsic muscles to, to find their proper shape. And that's harder to do on each pitch and each pressure. So I would rather not go to the default that we don't need to practice. We I would rather go to the, the configuration that that helps our tuning and helps sustain vibration. Mm. So, but if, if someone was say, under bad advice, say whispering for one or two days, do you think that's enough time for it to become um, a problem or does it take longer than that? It depends on the person, Right. I think. I mean, I, um, I, I just stay away from, I would much rather have someone talk in a more confidential voice, nose to nose, because that's actual vocal fold vibration. That configuration is is a, a normal configuration of the vocal folds, um, rather than talking a whisper because extrinsic muscles can tighten. They're pushing. It's inefficient. It's just not the best way to. I mean, it's like a violinist practicing with their bow upside down. I mean, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to practice in a weird way? You'd, you'd want to practice in, in you know, a, a toned down normal way than in something that isn't, isn't normal. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're sick of being in the orchestra. Was that going yeah. <laughs> to really get chosen? God, I hate, the, I hate yeah. being here every night. I'm just going to do this. They'll kick me out. <laughs> what were you going to say? I no, I was just going to say something equally as ridiculous. So we'll move on. <laughs> Let's crack on. Yeah. Great stuff. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank question. you. Question three. Um, I hear this one a lot, Karen, actually. I'd love to hear your, hear your, your props on this. But um, what's the best advice and resources for, resources for a teacher who wants to know more about formats and harmonics? I know it's supposed to be important, but I know absolutely nothing about it and get very confused reading anything in that subject. Um, help me find something simple and easy to digest uh, from from Nathan in the USA. Well, there there are a number of uh, websites on the web. I I honestly think that that's what we need to do more of is to um, make this something a little bit easier to understand in our outreach. Um, I don't I don't know typically what's what's out there right now, but I think. When you try to understand harmonics and formants, 
it's a process and um, everybody learns a little bit differently. Some people like the, the visual, um, some people want to get into the weeds and that's how they, they go step by step. Um, I don't, I don't have one website that is the key. Um, for me, as I started learning about this, it was just, uh, it, I was building, it was a process. So what, what made sense to me one day from one source of, of knowledge, uh, then I, I grabbed something from someone else and I tried to put it together in my mind. I know that um, if you're part of a, an organization, uh, there are many uh, basic uh, classes that you can take on acoustics. Um, I, I even took an acoustics class or got, got some books. There's some great websites um, that are out there if you just Google that shows you know particle movement and what what happens with with a wave sound, but everybody um, kind of brings this into their own uh, thought process differently according to their background. I mean, if you were in a studio all the time, you know about sound waves and you know how they interact in a studio, and so what. Uh, Health going, you know, getting education that way and bringing it into the the vocal tract. Um, Brad Story has a great website that's also, or I think it's called Tube Talk. If you want to Google that, it's it's based on a simulator and shows how um, sound is altered in a tube. Um, Ingo uh, has things out. If you look at NCBS websites, there's a vocal academy um, that kind of goes through some general um, ideas about acoustics and aerodynamics. Um, but this, it is a, it is something that it takes time to learn. So I don't want anyone to feel frustrated by that because it's taken me 20 years um, and it's a little bit of information here and there that's, that makes that starts to make sense. Yeah, you know, I think I think Steve and I can, can totally vouch for that. And uh, you know, it's uh, how many times have we sat in the van or the gig, you know, the gig car, um, in between podcast episodes or whatever, and you just as well as all of those things that you're reading, you also need somebody on a similar level to you, where you can talk about stuff and have conversations, and then you generate questions from that and then you go and find questions and you bring it back to the table and there's a lot of conversations going on for years and years and you just have to hear the same words 20 20 30 40 times before they sink in and before you know just what they are now um it's constant repetition isn't it you know i i, I I, I love the way that you said that I, the, when you said it takes time at the end as chris just said as well you know it's like because one thing that has come apparent to me over the over the years is that I think it's because singers, we, um, think it should come easy, because it's a singing thing. Whereas in fact it it's what it's like one of the only things that we include in what we do as singers and singing teachers that so isn't singing, <laughs> you know, because singing is the act of singing and with exercises that do do this, do this, do this. Whereas this is a whole new school of thought. And so when you said like time, it's like yeah, because. It, and it, if it starts with knowing what waveforms are and jump, let you say, the complexity of formats and harmonics, it's a million different concepts and terminology that you've probably never heard before in itself, which makes it more confusing. And more intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the first time uh, the a formant was described to me, someone described it to me as sand, you know, using a, a sieve or trying to get rocks and sand and um, and... That helped during that part of my um, understanding, but then, you know, I just went to a conference where Brad Story talks about, well, formants and bells, you know, when you strike a different shaped bell, it, it gives a different sound. And so that, that, the more examples that you can hear from different people and try to assimilate those, the, the better. So just don't ever stop trying to learn because the, the more you hear from different people, the more it, it 
um, solidifies your understanding. Karen, also from there's there's a there's a sentence in that that says, "I know it's important, but I just don't know why." <laughs> um, so uh, in in your, in your summary. Tell us and everyone else why even spending all this time learning about performance harmonics is worth it. Well, it's worth it because that's what you have been basically doing. You've been training your tube to maximize the sound, um, to filter the the harmonics, all of the the different waveforms that are that are in your mouth, that it, that are in your throat. You've been spending all this time adjusting little things um, to do just that. It's the explanation of all the training that you're you're doing. Um, so it it brings it down into more of a. I think it's helpful because it brings it to a a more common terminology. Uh, we we teach, and I love teaching through imagery, uh, but that's not always the accurate description. It helps in our teaching process, but if you really want to get to what's really going on, um, then you have to understand what these waveforms are, what these waves are doing in your mouth and in your throat, and why changing your tongue would make a difference why changing you know the height of your larynx would make a difference in the sound um so um, i think it's important because it brings us to a common knowledge when we get to science it gives us um, a more translatable language rather than saying you know oh, make it make it feel like you're singing out of your eyes well of course we're not singing out of our eyes or we're not you know um um, I don't know. Uh, there's there's all kinds the of different of imagery. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, but or or yeah, that the vibration is in your head. Well, it's it isn't in your head, and it isn't necessarily in your chest. But we can we have these sensations that we want to describe. But where did those sensations actually come from? That's the common knowledge that knowing how formants and harmonics and resonances work. Um, that's that's what brings us together absolutely mm. and it's great it's great when you're communicating yeah with other voice professionals that you can all kind of be on the level uh and get down to it even quicker um okay we are on to our fourth question um this fourth question is from natalie what's the latest on vibrato and its speed why are my clients' vibrato sometimes bleaty and super fast? And what's the best way to find the best sounding vibrato? Well, vibrato, the rate of vibrato is something that has something to do with uh, our pulse or our reflexes. And that's very difficult to train. Some people have very fast vibratos, some have low as far as the rate. The extent of the vibrato you can actually change as you go from a straight tone to a, a more wide um, extent. Um, and so we can we can uh, alter that in training. A bleedy sound sometimes shows that someone is maybe be a little, they might be a little nervous or they may not, their uh, vibrato may not be settled yet. Those muscles aren't coordinating as well. So good training and understanding what of a person's real true vibrato is and how they can kind of manipulate that, I think is really important. So I, I don't want anyone to feel like, oh, there's nothing you can do about it and just ignore it, it is what it is. Because you can, you can train and understand your vibrato and, and the extent of it. Um, sometimes we, uh, as we age, the vibrato, the rate gets a little bit slower. Um, but what we found is that those that continue singing and continue training are able to manipulate and, and at least give the perception that vibrato is, is uh, they can change that perception a little bit to the listener. So I think it's worth it to continue training, continue coordinating your breath, and, and the muscles of your larynx and finding that 
vibrato that sits well and is consistent with you and, and with your, your clients. Because it's much better to know how to manipulate something when it isn't variable. You know, if they're, if one day they have a, a bleeding and then another day they don't, that's hard to deal with. But when you're consistent, then you know what you can do to alter and give the, and change the perception of that vibrato. When we had this conversation earlier on in the year, Karen, but when you say the speed can, ch can be changed, it can't be changed, but the, um, the extent can what do you and there's, there, there's some new um, information even about the speed. I mean, we found that that people seem to entrain with each other too, and and it's that's why I, I recommend young singers that are developing their voices to to be in choirs, to listen to other singers, to try to manipulate that and and get that feedback so that it isn't something that is. Uh, they feel that they have no control over that they can they can start to experiment and get to know their voice and what what their voice can do. It's it's really incredible that isn't it? I remember you bringing out that research once of yeah the the sinking of vibrato within a group of singers that they all kind of gravitate towards the same speed, much like two dogs wagging their tails will often also come in sync and a, was it a couple yeah. of clocks on the wall as well or something like that a couple of pendulums that someone left for a day and then before long they were swinging in the same it's a it's an amazing phenomenon there's there's evidence too that even uh people that are are singing in choirs as they're singing their heartbeat in trains to each other and that i think there's a lot of of value in singing with other people um, and knowing that your voice can blend, it can it can entrain with others, and that way it can be flexible. That that it isn't just what it is, you know, and mm. move on. I think that's really great advice, mm. isn't it? To be singing, it's. I mean, it's a good reason for singing teachers as well to be helping their students model vibrato by singing along with them, yeah. um, as well. Uh, that's that's exactly what I mean. That feedback and that biofeedback through our ears and through our through feeling um, is is so important in training. So any way that you can uh, give more modalities, you know, visual, feel, tactile, um, uh, yeah, auditory, any way that you can. Um, help someone become more aware of what's going on in their in their throat will help them in in understanding their vibrato great stuff yeah. um that was uh yeah that was for natalie hope she has some some success with that okay we got we got a real a real kind of conundrum in this one we had a a, a listener get in touch with us so question five um and the question was super long, right? Because it's quite a story. <laughs> so instead of reading it out like a question, I just kind of uh, summarized it into a background, if that's okay. Uh, now this person sings in a choir, a female, maybe, maybe. I mean, she might be writing into me to, to tell me off on this one, but she looks maybe around about 32. Could, could get in trouble there. Um, and she does sing solo in the choir, but she is, and she does do it for fun. She's not professional. Um, but she had the problem of by like diplophonia or two notes at once started coming after she had a sickness. Um, Near to that time, she also was diagnosed with a nodule on her thyroid gland, which she had operated on. Um, voice improved after that op, after there was quite a bit of rest. and But then she got another illness and the diplophonia returned. Uh, mucus also happens when she's singing too. Now, for, for the benefit of everyone and yourself, we actually can play a sound file now of our singer and the particular symptom. Here we go. So this is a siren on an NG. Everyone I'm looking at 
I'm surrounded by your embrace. Baby, I can see a halo. You know you my saving grace. You're everything I need and more. It's written all over your face. Baby, I can feel your halo. I pray it won't fade away. I can see your halo. Halo, I can feel your halo. Halo, I can see your halo. Halo. And the upper bit is fine, but the it's just that middle bit, and then I then I have to clear my throat. So it's like something is just not right. So there's our sound file, Karen. What is your take on that? Well, um, what I noticed is that when uh, there were certain there was a certain pitch range that was difficult for her, and uh, where you could hear the the instability in the voice and where the diplophonia kind of comes out. Um, what I thought was interesting was that when she came from an upper range down in to that lower, that same range, the diplophonia wasn't there, mm. and so. I wonder if, um, yes, she, she may have some stiffness on one chord. There may be some, some chaotic vibration that happens in a certain part of a range due to, you know, what the stiffness of the chords are at that time, that, that pitch and the pressures. But um, I think that she has a lot of hope in um, coordinating with whatever she, whatever is going on with her vocal folds. I, I don't know because I didn't see the vocal cords themselves. I just have the audio. But whatever that chaotic vibration is happening, if if it doesn't if it isn't consistent all the time, then there are some strategies that she could use with coordinating the CT and TA, um, so that as she's coming down, she's letting off a little of of the pressure. She's allowing this um, coordination to happen smoothly. And um, so I actually, in listening to that, I thought, wow, some some training, some top-down training um, into that range would be very helpful. And also, um, if she can uh, change the, the shape of her vocal tract, I also think that that could be very helpful for her, too, as she's going um, through this instability in her voice. Now... When, when there's thyroid issues, when there's sickness, we always have changes in the, the source or the, the vocal folds. And when you have a little bit of swelling one day and you don't the next day, it's going to throw off all your tuning. <laughs> so that, that's probably frustrating for her because she is used to tuning a certain way or having her vocal tract a certain way. But now her, the, the source has changed. So it just means um, not to get frustrated by it, but to be flexible again with it as she's coming down and getting into that pitch range. See what happens if she changes the shape of her vocal tract or if she um, kind of changes the, the pressure, the subglottal pressure a little bit. Um, um, so those are, I think there's a lot of hope for her to, to use strategies to smooth that out. Sure, and when you say pressure, you, 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 um, do you feel airflow, airflow is coming through a little bit too quickly? And that's what you mean to kind of back off the, uh, the airflow a bit in the middle? Um, it, it could be backing off the airflow in coordination with maybe going to uh, a, a brighter sound down in that lower, in that lower pitch, so. Um, it, there could be some formant tuning that would help if she lowered her formants a little bit. Maybe that would give her a little bit more energy to keep that sound going, even when it wants to be chaotic. Mm. Um, okay. So, if so yeah, I think so there's a lot she could do in both respects: coordinating with the with the breath and and um, coming kind of a top down CTTA coordination. Right. So there isn't too much squeezing. Okay, that's great because you know what you know. I know a lot of people do um, do uh, worry, obviously, about the state of their vocal folds uh, in these situations, right? And um, you know, for, for, uh, being the being the expert in the room right now, um, can you reassure people as to if they hear this, 
How can you reassure them that it's not necessarily a vocal injury, that it is a, uh, a trainable aspect? Yeah, well, I, I think all of us in, in some respects has episodes of vocal injury, right? I mean, we all get that. But it's is it to the degree where it's consistent all the time? That's when you should go and see someone, you know, and see if there's there's a, a lesion or something there. But we, we all have different changes in, in edema and swelling. And so it's a matter of if, it, if it's something like that, can I adjust things a little bit to adjust for that swelling in the source? There's some mornings I wake up and I'm hoarse, and I don't know why. I don't know if I've had a maybe a reflex event or if I talked too much, you know, a couple days ago, and that's why I'm a little swollen. But it's getting to know um, what can I do to be flexible with that and still allow it to work and, and give a little bit of extra help along the way with changing my the shape of my vocal tract or coordinating with my breath. Great stuff. Okay, that conclu concludes the questions. Our questions. Um, so all that's left to say, actually, we would we would like to um, uh, have a very quick chat about your wonderful organisation, which is the Pan American Vocology Association, of which we're both members ourselves. Um, that is a, a, a brilliant association that encompasses all kinds of disciplines from scientists to speech pathologists uh, and vocal coaches, all with that, that common goal of digging deeper and deeper um, into voice use, like you said, on an exceptional level. Um, and it's a brilliant organisation to be hooking up with people who um, can also help you on your journey uh, of education, like one of our previous uh, listeners had asked how to how to get better at this stuff. You know, wh why would you say it was a great idea for someone to go and check that out? Well, um, the reason is is because I think sometimes we we've been fractured in different disciplines. We kind of feel alone um, in many respects because voice is not. This, this big, you know, not everybody is advocating for the singing voice necessarily. We love to hear it, but we're not, we, not everybody um, understands why um, we need an advocate for us in, in our jobs and in our, um, for our own mental health. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the, the singing voice um, is, helps our quality of life. Um, but it's not just the singing voice. Uh, exceptional uh, voice use, I think, is really important. If we get to the point where we are just uh, vocal texting, where we have no emotion whatsoever, or we we don't show that, that side of us, um, that connection soul to soul um, that we have through our voices, I think we lose something as a society. And so we really want to advocate for um, using the instrument the way it should be used, it, the way it should be played, instead of kind of going to default and, and just getting through. Um, we, we do this actually when we think about our body as a whole. Nobody wants to be a couch potato. We all know that that isn't, that isn't exceptional use. That's not using our body. And if we, if we don't use it, we lose it. And I think it would be a travesty if we... Um, got to the point where we didn't really advocate for exceptional voice use, and we just kind of got through um, through our communication, you know, when when we have to. Um, so there's there's a lot about about the voice as as it relates to a public health issue and um, an outreach, um, knowing you know how how we can use our voices in an exceptional manner, I think is extremely valuable because other species, they don't have um, speech to complicate the problem. Uh, they just vocalize and that's how they communicate. And they use their instrument to the fullest extent because that's, that's what they need. They need to go if, to high pitches and low pitches. Um, our instrument can do all of that, but as a whole, we kind of migrate as a society to a very restricted range, and we don't we don't use it like we should. 
And that's really what PAVA is about, is using, um, advocating for voice as a whole in many different disciplines. Because if we're fractured, um, then we don't have a voice. It's coming together so that voice actually has a voice and we can advocate for it. Great stuff. Um, that's, there's a lot of benefits there, uh, the community like you've just described, but um, uh, to, to put a few out there as well, you also do hold conferences, which we spoke about earlier, where lots of these professionals of all levels get together um, for presentations and networking, um, chatting, uh, resources on your website, which is pava, P-A-V-A dash vocology org is am I right in saying that um, that's where you can find out more about that we will also um, put that in the show notes but also you also unveiled a recent uh, simulator where you can build a vocal tract and some vocal folds and put air through them with this software so you can see how the vocal tract interacts now that is mental, mental. and amazing so uh, how can if how can people actually you know get a hold of that and start messing around with that well, um, it comes with your membership. It's a free, free app. So if if you do decide to be a member of Pava, which we do want, uh, we want a wide variety of, of uh, disciplines and input um, from our members. It's a member driven organization, so you actually do have a say. You have a voice in the organization. And as we have launched this new app. Uh, the simulator, we want to hear your feedback of what what you think um, it could help you uh, do. The nice thing about a simulator is that it's, it's much simpler than doing human subject type of studies because with the human subject you have many different variables and it's very hard to isolate one. With a simulator you can make someone's vocal tract one a straw if you want to. You can make their, um, have very consistent anatomy and properties and change one or two variables, uh, which then can lead to, towards um, more human subject study and investigation. So the way you get it is by being a member. Um, and we want your voice. We want uh, singing teachers all over the world to um, come and share their insights and their experience because that's what develops the questions that we need to to help in our in in our studies. Uh, we need to know what is salient to the community and what's important for them. Um, otherwise, you know, we can study something, but if it doesn't relate or help anyone, what's the point? No. So we need to have have your questions and your voice in the organization. And and the nice thing is that you know as we develop this app, we want your input, and we'll put in phrases or different um, parts of the application so that it can apply to you and your questions. And just to say, there, Karen, this isn't an app that's just been born out of. Silicon Valley over the past year with somebody like investing a couple hundred thousand pounds and it's been about 30 years in the making, right? Yeah, the simulator has been, uh, it started with, I don't know if anyone knows of Pava Robachi when Inga would yes. go around and, and, and perform with uh, the robot. Um, what basically it's, it's in the, the simulator has been in development for over 30 years, and it truly is based on all of the, the scientific equations and the studies that have been in the journals for, for years. Inputting that knowledge into the, the simulator is what is, I think, the, the most valuable part. So it's very dynamic. Um, as we learn more, we add more. We do more with it. So, um, but we, we also want to ask the right questions and we need your input. Great stuff. Yeah. We're, we're going to demo, we're going to chuck in a, a small demo of that. Yep. Let's, here we go. Here's it in action. Kivox and Silico is a computer program with nothing but mathematics. And what we try to do is write all of the uh, equations that determine how tissue and air move. So. Here we can choose a vocal source, 
and I'm going to choose the fiber gel finite element model. And we can choose a vocal tract. Here's the outline of the vocal tract. All right, and then we can just hit run. And what you see now is a cross section through the vocal folds. The yellow is the ligament and the red is the muscle. Okay, so, so like we said, you can get yourself along to pava-vocology.org. Um, we'll put the links on the blog post. Anybody who's interested in becoming a member, um, we highly recommend it. Karen obviously does. It's a great organization. So get yourself along there. Also, we have another little treat for people at the end of this episode, don't we, Karen? Uh, in the form of some brand new educational videos from yourself and, and, and Ingo uh, on the straw. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's one thing that as we've uh, been a part of this organization, I realized uh, very quickly that uh, we this information that has been developing over the, the last 30 years hasn't reached the masses. Um, only a few in an upper part of the pyramid understand uh, what all of the science, what, what the new um, techniques are all about and why they work. Why does straw work? Why does resonance work? We've, we've known for centuries that a resonant voice is a clearer, easier voice, but we've never really understood why. And so this is a, an attempt to describe in hopefully easier terms of the science behind why the straw and why resonance in the vocal tract helps the vocal folds vibrate. Amazing. And sustain that vibration, yeah. So anyone who's interested, which is probably everyone, <laughs> um, will uh, or should hang on till the episode finishes and um, the three-part video series will run in in its concurrent form for around 12 minutes. Um, so hang around and listen to it, everyone. But um, before we cue that, Karen, thank you very much for your time. Um, and for your knowledge and answering everyone's questions. We hope to see you again very soon. You know, and I would just say on off the back of that, we are so lucky to have you uh, as part of our team or family, let's call it, because uh, <laughs> we just are, we just are. And I think that, it can, you know, it can often just be taken for granted sometimes, but truly, like, it's so powerful and it benefits so many people. So thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It really is. Thank you. Lovely. Enjoy the rest of your day. Wowzers. Wowzer wee wow wazers. She speaks like a legend, of course. Um, like, like you've heard in the interview there, get yourself along to pava, pava-vocology.org. Um, it is a great organisation to be a part of if you are a teacher, uh, especially if you want to get more connected to the scientific world, um, which is super duper valuable. Um, and like we say, go, go and check out that Vox and Silico software that you get free as being a member. Um, if you have any questions for Karen or about the episode, uh, please do get in touch with us via the website, which is thenakedvocalist.com. There's a contact form there. Um, we're happy to answer your questions. And if you have any questions for the show or any suggestions for the show as well, uh, we are constantly plugging the survey, which is thenakedvocalist.com forward slash survey. But for now, it's getting into the special treat. Roll video. I know you didn't expect this, but your straw video has gone viral and everyone is using it because it works. There's an immediate difference we feel right after we use this thin straw and many describe it as easier, more resonant, clearer, but can you help us explain why this thin straw works so well? Vocalization through a thin straw puts your vocal folds in the most optimum position and shape for vibration, which encourages efficiency. That's why voicing becomes easier. A better position and shape of the vocal folds helps start a clear, easy sound, especially when the vocal folds stiffen for high pitches or swell due to inflammation. I've shown how vocal folds vibrate by vibrating my lips. When my lips are healthy and barely touching, they vibrate very easily. 
when they stiffen or swell, they leak too much air. I have to bring them closer together and shape them differently to get them to vibrate easily again. Is that what you mean by optimal vocal fold position and shape for vibration? Yes, and the straw will help you train the intricate muscles of the larynx to adjust for that stiffening to start vibration. When your lips were stiffer, you had to adjust just how they come together. You probably squared them up, which required less pressure to start the vibration. Okay, that makes sense because I felt that adjustment. The vocal folds produce that kind of sound, but we know that the sound becomes more interesting as it travels through our throat and mouth. I know you refer to this as the vocal tract. So can you explain why the vocal tract is an important part of simulating the vocal instrument? Sure, the vocal folds produce that simple buzz-like sound like the lip buzz that you just demonstrated. If you compare this with a trumpet, the trumpeter's lips create sound waves or frequencies that are filtered as they travel through the trumpet horn. Both the horn and the human vocal tract resonate and selectively boost sound waves produced by the lips and our vocal folds. The resonance of these tubes allows for the unique sound you hear in both instruments. So why use a thin straw to train muscles into optimal positioning and shape? It doesn't produce a big sound like a trumpet at all. The sound produced when you use a straw is small on the outside, but that small vibration of the vocal folds is ideal for training because it allows you to find optimal positioning and shape before full vibration and collision of the vocal folds take place. Ah, I see. The vocal folds collide hundreds of times a second, so training them without wearing them out is fantastic. But why thin straws? Do they work better? You know, that's fascinated me for the last few decades as I study air pressure and sound waves in the vocal tract by computer simulation. Thinner straws have two benefits. The steady back pressure from a thinner straw resets the vocal fold shape as they vibrate. It separates them at the top when needed and allows you to square them up to lower the lung pressure needed to start vibration. The other benefit of the straw is that it maximizes an interaction between the vocal folds and the vocal tract as sound waves are reflected back to them. This interaction also helps them sustain their vibration. So to sum up, the straw helps train the optimal position and shape of vocal folds without wearing them out. Using thin straws square up the vocal folds so it takes less effort to start vibration and a sound wave interaction between the vocal folds and the vocal tract is maximized to sustain that vibration. These two benefits make your vocal instrument more efficient and produces a clearer, easier, and more resonant sound. If the straw maximizes an interaction between the vocal folds and the vocal tracts as sound waves are reflected back to them and this interaction helps sustain vibration, what happens when the straw and the back pressure are gone? Does something else replace the straw to help sustain vibration and maintain an interaction with the vocal folds? Yes, I would say so. My computer simulation studies show that the narrow epilarynx tube in the vocal tract right above the vocal folds plays an important role in maintaining this interaction. Let's use the example of playing the trumpet again. Imagine the trumpeter trying to sustain vibration of his lips without his mouthpiece. Narrowing or lengthening the epilarynx tube maximizes a push-pull interaction of positive and negative sound pressure waves right above the vocal folds. This push-pull interaction helps sustain vibration. An added benefit of the narrowing and lengthening of the epilarynx tube is the brilliance and ringing quality of the sound that we hear. The positive and negative pressure changes in the vocal tract right above the vocal folds that create this push-pull effect and sustain vibration is difficult to picture. The diagram helps, but what do these pressures really look like? 
Unfortunately, you can't see them, but if those pressures are large enough, you can feel them vibrate the horn of a trumpet or your facial bones. Those pressures come from sound, not from steady air pressure. When you use the straw, it maximizes sound pressure waves back to the vocal folds. When you open your mouth, the back pressure is gone, but the straw helped shape the vocal folds. Sound pressure waves continue to reflect back to the vocal folds and help them sustain their vibration. Wait, this is a new concept. I assume that the Bernoulli effect is what sustains phonation. But now I realize that there is something else going on that explains why straw and resonance work. The push-pull of positive and negative sound pressure waves right above the vocal folds reminds me of something. At the park, when my boy was a toddler, he wanted to swing and he would sit there while I would kept pushing every time the swing came back. I kept the swing going, but it was a lot of work. Finally, he helped me when he learned to pump his legs and lean back when swinging at the park. Is Bernoulli pressure like my push? I'm thinking the Bernoulli effect is important to start vibration, just like my push. But if we rely only on that, we can tire out because we are constantly pushing air less efficiently than if we use the vocal tract to maximize the interaction. Yes, Bernoulli pressure starts vibration, but only if alternating convergent and divergent glottal shapes change airflow and pressure during the glottal cycle. This is important, but alone isn't the whole picture. That's why resonant voices have been known to be more efficient voices. We can wear out if we only create the push-pull with Bernoulli airflow and pressure. The extra positive and negative pressure created by the sound waves are like the little movements of your son leaning forward and back while pumping his legs. Those movements help keep the swing going. The equivalence of that in the vocal tract is known as inertive reactance. The child learns to anticipate or prepare for the next swing and that allows you to push less frequently because of the push-pull he brings into the system. Self-sustained oscillation of the vocal folds is not created by the Bernoulli principle alone. There's a more efficient way of sustaining the voice and you can find that extra push-pull by using the straw. So to sum up, if I use the straw, my vocal folds and the muscles surrounding them in the vocal tract will learn the most efficient position and shape for self-sustained phonation. And that also makes the instrument more efficient. Singers love the straw. After they warm up or reset their voice with the straw, they notice an ease and flexibility in their voice. They're able to smooth out voice breaks as they approach difficult notes with more consistency. Why is this the case? The straw allows for consistent interaction because the lip opening and back pressure are constant. My simulation studies produce inertograms that show that narrowing the tube in strategic places like above the vocal folds with the epilaryngeal tube at the lips or with a straw help improve the push-pull interaction above the vocal folds. That push-pull interaction of sound pressure waves also helps singers transition through the resonances in the vocal tract that can cause voice breaks. The straw gives us more flexibility as we train muscles to adjust optimally to change in pitch and loudness. The straw also helps us find our optimal pitch range for speech. I think most singers and speakers want that flexibility. Sometimes we want that tender, soft high note or need that strong, low resonance that create interest and expresses meaning. Unpredictable voice breaks are frustrating and can get in the way. I'm fascinated by your inertograms that show how and where the straw maximizes the vocal tract pressures, shown in green so positively in our vocal range. The inertograms I've introduced in the Vocology book are helpful visualizations of vocal tract inertance or the push-pull interaction we've been talking about. The inertograms can help show us how to transition through voice breaks 
and why the epilaryngeal tube and the straw increase efficiency when we need it in our vocal range. When we experience efficiency in our voice, we start to learn the most optimal vocal fold position and shape, as well as the optimal shape of the vocal tract. Can this apply to optimizing the vocal instrument for preservation? We're all trying to preserve flexibility and muscle mass as we age, and will that help prevent injury? Of course, using the vocal instrument efficiently will prevent injury, and as you use it fully, as it should be played, you will preserve flexibility and muscle mass. This is similar to what we are encouraged to do with the rest of our body as we age. I know there's increasing evidence that straw phonation helps rehabilitate injured vocal folds that are stiff and swollen. You're right. Straw-like therapy protocols are not inferior to other well-known therapy protocols that focus on optimal use for healing. So to sum up, if the vocal folds are in the wrong position and are shaped poorly and the vocal tract isn't helping as it could, the straw exercises will teach the intricate muscles of the vocal instrument to adjust efficiently in our vocal range. This is helpful for preserving an efficient vocal instrument, preventing injury, and rehabilitating injured, stiff, or swollen vocal folds. Yes, if you use the straw often, with lots of variability in pitch and loudness, the muscles will remember those adjustments and preserve a more efficient instrument.